And well, welcome. Welcome back. Chris Spiker for Minding Your Business on News Talk 1380, the Lancaster Chamber of Commerce weekly radio program. Hope you're enjoying your Saturday. And that music is by Lions Named Leo, a group out of Bakersfield that let us use the music for our bumper music here. My next guest is Sky Young. He's a member of the Lancaster Chamber, and it says here you're a grant writer. That's correct. So, grant writer. Yeah. What do you want to know about well, it? Well, you just make money? No, actually... You just ask for money? It kind of ask for money. More than anything, when nonprofits um, are in need of funding to meet their um, annual budgets and projects they're working on, they come to me and I sit down with them and try to hammer out a plan of what exactly it is they're trying to get funding for and what their mission is. And then we go and I've got a list of funders that I've used in the past. Um, everything from major foundations like the Parsons Group all the way down to small groups such as the Antelope Valley College Foundation okay. offering out grants yeah, local. and funding. So anywhere from what's the range? A thousand dollars to a million or I've done grants for anywhere from a thousand dollars up to a half a million dollars. And these people uh, give your project money because they know you or because the way you package the, the ask or is the packaging the ask and there's also the part where they set out a bunch of guidelines, and as long as we fall within their guidelines and their mission, and we're furthering their goal on their end, um, they're more than willing to give back money in so most cases. Is this kind of like scholarships, where there are more scholarships out there than are, are, are given? Is there great yeah. money out there that just stays on the table? There is. In fact, some places, like the Parsons Group, they're constantly accepting new grants and new funding, and a lot of it becomes a relationship that the grant writer builds with the funder. Right. Where you've gone there a couple times asking for grant money for different community groups or even larger groups, and after a while you build a rapport and they start wanting to help you out more and more because they know that you're a trusted writer. So they might like you because you're not a flake and you have a great track record and they like they like the kind of work you do. You do. Yeah. So then you're kind of careful about who you take on as clients. I'm so careful because there's so many people out there that say they have a great project. Yeah. And it turns out they don't. It turns out that maybe they're wanting money for personal gain or whatnot. Yeah, like a new car or something? New car. I've, I've heard some that want to go and remodel their house. Or <laughs> yeah. That's called a bank loan, right? Yeah. That's how you do that. How did you get into the grant writing business? It's kind of an odd story. I worked on my first grant with the Animal Fly Royal Museum of History with Bill Rawlings and Giovanni Simi and all the other great people oh, yeah. that are over right. there. And I was actually in a class at the time on grant writing that I had taken as an elective. And one of the um, parts of the elective class was to actually write a grant and try to get it funded. Wow, that would be a good uh, pass or fail. And while we didn't get funded the first time, which is not uncommon for most grant writers when they're starting out, um, it gave me my grounding and I fell in love with the challenge that it is. Yeah. Uh, trying to go out there and go after money. And um, later on, after I left the Royal Museum for a short time, I had also given them their groundwork to start going after grants because they were kind of nervous having only tried it once before and having failed. Right. And they were able to take the knowledge I had left on the table and work on them some grants on their own. And they were able to get a Edison grant, which they helped use for their scholarships. Right. And they also have received a County of Los Angeles grant from Mike Antonovich that's helped them with their library. And they have quite a substantial library going right now. And unfortunately, it's not exactly where it could be because they're still looking for funding to build their permanent home. But yet they currently have um, 
a large collection of yearbooks from Amplified High School. Oh yeah. Going back from the very, very start. Yeah. Um, Heart Printers, I believe, donated a fair amount of old newsletters from the 60s and 50s and they were able to receive um, some photography collections. Oh, One of them is right. Lee Burkholz's yep. um, collection. Yeah. Upon his um, passing, which I don't want it to happen anytime soon because he's a great guy. He is a great guy. He's my mentor, but um, he decided to leave his complete collection Two storage units full of photos, negatives, slides, you name it, to the museum in hopes that it'll be they'll be cherished and preserved for years to come. Yeah. We've also been working on getting um, a hold of Frank Stubney's collection. Right. Wow. And um, Jack Overlay. Jack Overlay, yeah. Valley Press. Valley yeah. Press and Ledger Gazette, Ledger Gazette before that. Before that, right. In fact, um, when Bill Bill, Bill yeah. Gillis? When Bill, Bill, Rawlings Bill Rawlings tells me that some of the other collections they've received are just phenomenal. It was all grassroots there, and yeah, right. that's how I got started. And today I've worked with, um, working on one right now, trying to find some funding for Little Rock FA. So you're mainly staying in the valley? I'm right? staying in the valley. Uh -huh. And the reason for that is because while I could branch out and go outside the area, I want to keep it close to home because this is my community that's given me so much, so I want to give back to them. Well, you definitely do. I've seen you volunteering uh, at the fair also uh, with Sharon Weisenberger. Yeah. You work over there with the flowers. In fact, I'm actually going on my um, 20th year of volunteering at the fair. I think you're, you're right behind her. She's only 21 or 22 years, isn't she? I don't know how long she's been volunteering, but forever. I started out there, started with the 4-H, and went from there into the FA when I had Sharon as an FA instructor right. at Quartz Hill High School. And she brought me into wanting to do um, more with the community, and that's where I got my strong leadership background is from her. She helped me get my American Farmers degree, which is less than 1%. Wow. Of all FFA members within the United States actually re achieve. Oh, she did amazing things. She did that. amazing things with yeah. me and helped me yeah. really, really build my love of community service and wanting to. And speaking of community, you even joined the Chamber of Commerce. I did. Why did you do that? I mean, I'm surprised happily. Well, actually, I've been kind of intimidated by the Chamber at first, thinking. These are well-to-do business people. These are people that um, are way beyond my years of being active in the community. They're almost my older people I look up to, like Sandy Smith and yourself. And I was asked by you um, to be on the fill in for you on the Christmas parade for Palmdale. Yeah. And after meeting Sandy and meeting a bunch of other people face to face and talking with them. Including Doug, yeah, just in here. Yeah, I go. This isn't a bad group. It's nothing to be intimidated about. And it's found out that it's almost more of a social, a lot of social interaction more than anything else, and building partnerships with within the community and meeting people. And somehow, I'm, somehow you make a sale out of that eventually. Yeah, it's not all about you're not going to be selling stuff every day. But in fact, know. I found that it's worked great for me. Because I've gotten a couple clients out of it. Really? I have. And one of them is um, Adorable Babies, uh -huh. which is a uh, nursery school right now, going into um, starting on doing STEM and turning work for older kids now and looking for a place and funding so they can grow and do more within the community. And right now we're trying to work out whether or not to go for grants or to go more for building public relations because within a whole other aspect of myself, my business, I also do public relations work and communications, which is my degree, have a degree in interdisciplinary studies, which combines both the love of communications with public relations to make a hybrid almost. Mm -hmm. And so right now we're doing more trying to get their, their name out there and build 
done some work to me your rapport with what's going on and try to go and help them find funding more locally than on the grant level because a lot of their projects they want to do are things that they could really achieve better by going after more local funding from things like the Ronnie Marsh um, Children's Charities of the Emerald Valley right, and so forth. But really I've loved it every step of the way. Everything I do, it's, it's a labor of love and volunteering and nonprofit work is where I find my biggest passions. Yeah. Looking to get a master's degree soon in really? um, public policy um, with an emphasis on nonprofit management. And then beyond everybody's wildest dreams, I also want to get my um, PhD eventually in philanthropy. Uh. <laughs> because I want to turn not just writing the grants, yeah. but I want to see what goes on in the minds of the people who are actually being the funders. Right. The grantees. Wow. And I know there's a lot of people out there that would like to give more to the community and give back yeah. and create endowments. And um, So you're going to be working for one of the funders then? I will, most likely. Yeah, managing a fund. Or I'll be out there creating my own fund and helping raise money through large endowments that need to be created and whatnot and being managing them. You're going to help the uh, the American the Antelope Valley Rural Museum of History uh, market those uh, photos and those images that they have from their extensive collections and then you'll be managing all the money from the uh, from the licensing of those photos. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. You never know. Yeah, yeah they've got a little treasure there with all the, the people. They really do. In fact, that's my first love right now is in the World Museum of History because they gave me my start and helped give me vision and insight onto where I want to go with my career and yeah. I started out working with them when I was in my um, first years in my bachelor's program and have continued working with them ever since. You've grown along with the museum. We've grown along with the museum. In fact, I was shocked at a recent um, members dinner when it was pointed out to the members that we've been going for 10 years now. We started out with the um, LFI um, Rural Olympics Hall of Fame. Right. In the Homars building, which was, I believe the Pocket building. Right. And we moved from there into filling up almost the complete agricultural building within the off season, giving school tours. Yeah. And tours to anybody else who's interested and um, doing so many great tasks and things. So you, you've, you've spent your whole uh, time on this show talking about uh, the Rural History Museum, but it really isn't such an important part of the Antelope Valley. It's been going for 10 years? Yeah. And the, the, their permanent home, will it be on the fairgrounds? or It will be. It will almost be facing um, the administrative offices. And we've already been given the land by the fair, and just need to really break ground. Need to raise um, another hundred thousand dollars, a little bit more than that. I believe it's about one hundred and fifty, hundred sixty thousand dollars. Well, I think and you'll, you'll we'll be able, be able to help. break ground and have our permanent home, and that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for that. I'm looking for the rich aunt and uncle, or the rich donor. <laughs> yeah which are hard to find, especially in the grant world, because there's not a lot of capital building grants out there. Sky Young, how do people find you with uh, contact information? I'm listed on the Chamber's website under the Members Directory, or they can reach me. Um, my cell phone number is 661-902-8687. Um, Feel free to give me a jingle, or Look me up on face Facebook. That's right. We talk on Facebook. Sky Young, grant writer, thank you very much for coming You're on. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. You bet.